نسينا من الخادم ما ملك والخادم ما صلاك ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي لا صلاك مستقيم ولا آلي حق قدره المختار النازين. Respected scholars, dear beloveds, I'm well aware that I'm probably the least knowledgeable person to address you today or tomorrow. But it's my uh, great honor, and I speak to you mostly um, as an academic, unfortunately, um, is to give you some sense of this, uh, what I think a very interesting historical phenomenon called the Tariqa Muhammadiyah. Now there's a dispute whether this is actually uh, historically unique or not. Um, I'm one of those that take the opinion that it, it, uh, yes and no. It represents sort of a, a culmination and a further elaboration of the, uh, the, of the existing Islamic uh, intellectual tradition, um, but uh, receiving culmination by the end of the 18th century. Um, but from a, a, a broader perspective, if I may editorialize here for a second before boring you with these uh, historical details. Um, from a broader perspective, I think what we see um, is right on the dawn of the modern era, right before uh, colonial occupation of Muslim societies, right before the drastic changes in pedagogical techniques that would uh, unleash new, re new, new ways of reading texts and new ways of interpreting the Islamic message, which uh, many of us are still in the process of responding to with this uh, discourse about the return to the tradition and uh, Sheikh Jabir Haddad has been formative in that from our own understanding, so thank you and uh, others in this room as well. Uh, but right at the dawn of this modern era, what we find is um, the uh, culmination, if you will, of the Islamic tradition. Now this is an interesting um, predicament because a lot of the historians and a lot of the Orientalists have described the late 18th century as a time of uh, the decline, of the incredible decline of the Muslim world. Obviously they're looking at political aspects. Um, but we know, of course, that some of the greatest uh, intellectual output in, the Muslim, in Muslim history came at times of intense political upheaval. The Abbasid Caliphate, the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, the time of Muhammad al-Ghazali, of course, not known for political stability. Um, so what we find then is this um, an interesting formulation of the Islamic tradition uh, uh, building upon the, the strength of the tradition but articulating it in a very dynamic way. Um, and, and, and these are the, this is the, the movement that has largely been forgotten in many circles today, but um, it is in fact what um, uh, the current state of Islamization of Muslim societies is responsible for it. The, the, the anti-colonial resistance in the early 19th century, they were the ones that led jihad against uh, colonial occupation all over the Muslim world. Uh, particularly in Africa. Um, so, uh, uh, and if I may step back a little bit and talk about, you know, uh, how to how to view events in history. Now, it's easy to say, well, if if, if something didn't exist at the time of the Prophet, say, so he never spoke of something called Tariqa Muhammadiyah. Of course, he never spoke of uh, the, the Tariqa either. Um, how to how to view the elaboration of the Islamic tradition in history. It has to be seen, uh, I believe, and many others better than you believe, uh, as, as a sign of Allah's continuing rahmah, his continuing mercy to the community um, of, of Muhammad Sallallahu um, And if I may pick up on the esteemed Sheikh Hisham Kabani's uh, quotation of a hadith, Ulama Ummati Ka bin Israel, that the scholars of my community are like the prophets of the children of Israel. There are others. Um, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. So there are an interesting hadith that point to the continued guidance through the ulama, uh, a prophetic guidance, if you will. No, not a new revelation, 
but a continued guidance to this community. Now, if we couple that with uh, other interesting hadith, you know, the, the ru'ya of the righteous believer is one of 46 parts of prophecy. Or well, that uh, the Prophet said, who has seen me has seen me, because shaitan cannot take my form. Uh, so if we, if we couple, if we put all of these um, narrations together, we come up with uh, uh, the, the clear uh, conclusion that uh, there is uh, continued guidance to this, to this community. So the elaboration of the Islamic tradition over time, I'm a historian, um, I see the, I, I think it's impossible not to see the hand of Allah in the guidance of the Muslim community. I mean, there's also misguidance, of course, um, but the, the, the sort of uh, Sunni mainstream, um, my community cannot uh, agree on an error, for example. Uh, there seems to be this guidance. Um, so, um, and perhaps I will just open this talk um, before describing what the Tariqa Muhammadiyah is um, and its historical elaboration by the end of the 18th century. Uh, with a very interesting quote, it comes in the Jawahir Mani of uh, Sheikh Ahmad Ijani. He says, know that the Prophet وسلم, used to impose general rules on the general populace of Ma'am during his lifetime. Thus, when he declared something unlawful, it became unlawful for everyone. When he prescribed something, he prescribed it for everyone. This was the case for all manifest rulings of the Sharia the sacred law. In addition to these general rulings, he وسلم, used to instruct the elite, the Khasa, with special knowledge and he used to single out certain of his companions and not others for certain affairs. This is something well known and thoroughly recorded in the traditional reports concerning him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was transferred to the abode of the hereafter, the situation was therefore the same, was therefore the same as it had been during his life in this world. He had begun to trust to his community the special command for the elite, but without modification of the general command given to everyone. So modification of the general command ceased with his death, Sallallahu while a flood of his grace, Faydu, persisted in providing the special command of the elite. Whoever imagines that all of his support for his community came to an end with his death, Sallallahu as in the case of other dead men, he is ignorant of the Prophet's rank, Sallallahu He is guilty of treating him indecently, and he is therefore in danger of dying as an unbeliever if he does not repent of his deluded conviction. Um, so if you don't mind to go to the next slide. So, um, briefly then, the description of what the Tariqa Muhammadiyah is. It's a, uh, it's a scholarly network that spans the Muslim world by the end of the 18th century. It includes the greatest scholars of Cairo, Medina Manawara, Mecca, uh, Delhi, uh, and in and, and, and Africa as well. Um, basically, it's characterized, there are several elements that go into this as described by uh, scholars. Uh, the first is an external component which has to do with the sort of um, increased emphasis on the Sunnah of the Prophet um, Increased study of Hadith, we find uh, Hadith uh, is not networks um, people in the search of, uh, of Islam seems to, uh, the fascination of this seems to increase. Um, people, of course, are, are searching for the shortest uh, hadith chain. They, uh, a lot of these scholars um, articulate um, the importance of ijtihad, scholarly reasoning, outside of the madhab. Um, in practice, however, um, all of these scholars are actually retaining the madhab. Um, Sheikh Ahmad Jani, for example, refers to the uh, Imam Malik as uh, Imam Una, Imam Malik. So he's uh, clearly situating himself still within the, the Maliki madhab while not uh, claiming any exclusive visit, uh, exclusiveness for this particular madhab. Um, this is also the idea of the Tawali. The, the saint of God should be involved in the society. Um, 
I, I guess I should, I should back up and just point out that none of these ideas are actually new. Right? Um, the same thing with um, opinion, fit opinions or um, the development of the Turuk uh, in, in the 13th and uh, 12th century. Um, none of these ideas are new. Their particular form, their particular emphasis uh, due to historical context might be uh, new. That's sort of a, a quantitative difference rather than a qualitative difference. Um, uh, so, if, for example, if somebody were to claim that uh, the the truk uh, 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 because or, or, or a blameworthy innovation because they're not mentioned um, in the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, then of course you'd have to likewise throw out the tradition of fiqh, you have to throw out the tradition uh, of kalam, one of philosophy, um, of calligraphy of a whole lot of other sciences that uh, obviously elaborated themselves based upon principles in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, uh, but it took historical form in certain historical uh, contexts. So here we have a lot of ideas uh, that have been seen before, uh, not necessarily new, but the way that they're combined together in one, uh, uh, one sort of ideology, if you will, I hate to use that word, but one sort of um, uh, school, the way that they're all combined together to, to give um, a particular, to have a particular historical impact in the late 19th century, in the late uh, 18th century, uh, must be conceived as something that's new. And this is why um, a lot of academic scholars of an earlier generation, um, I think wrongly, have described this movement as neo Sufism. Right? They were basically confronted with a whole lot of these new Sufi orders the Sanusia, the Tijaniya, um, and, and others as well that were actually renditions of, of, of older Tariqas um, that are fighting them, right? They're, <laughs> they're, they're resisting colonial conquest. They can't figure out how Sufism, which was thought to be something uh, that was uh, quietistic, or mystically inclined, uh, was all of a sudden being used for uh, the, the resistance to colonial conquest. So they start to say, well, neo-Sufism is the sort of uh, combination of Wahhabi extremism with the organization of the Sufi lodge. Um, so this uh, the, the sort of emphasis on describing these movements as Tariqa Muhammadiyya is, is an attempt to correct that earlier uh, wrong assumption.